Thank you. And thank you for everybody who's still with us. Um, I really appreciate it, and thank you for having me here. Um, I promise to be on time. Please remind me if I'm uh, running out of time. I'll be able to remind you. And um, I know that uh, Shulamit is going to have like a very nice uh, presentation after me, so um, I just have one image for you, as I did not find any pictures uh, which are really relate to the time I'm talking about. So, to give your eyes a little rest, there's an image of the um, Jewish hospital in Berlin. Now I will start. The existence of a shelter for children of Jewish descent from so-called mixed marriages in the Jewish hospital at Iranische Straße in Berlin is directly connected with the last stages of liquidation, liquidation of Germany, German and especially Berlin Jews. In the course of the deportations from Germany in 1943, only Jewish spouses from so-called mixed marriages and their children remained behind, to whom the final solution had not yet been applied. The hospital of the Berlin Jewish community in the district of Wedding existed since 1913. Its actual history dates back more than uh, 250 years. And it was the only Jewish hospital in Germany that received an operation permit from the Gestapo until the end of war. Also, the hospital underwent structural and personal changes Due to, the, due to the Nuremberg racial laws, it did not lose its good reputation, uh, which it had earned before the war, due to its excellent medical staff until the deportations. During the war, and especially during the period when the deportations of German Jews were already in full swing, it remained the only hospital that could accept sick, uh, ill Jews from all over the Reich, after all Jewish hospitals and doctors' offices had been liquidated by the Nazis. During the years of 1943 to 1945, the hospital continued to operate with Jewish staff, which, however, decreased due to deportations, which did not stop at the doctors and nurses of the Jewish hospital. In the course of this time, the hospital developed into a kind of a Jewish ghetto in which the Jews who had been concentrated by the Nazis and who continued to remain in Germany were gathered. My presentation examines the circumstances of the gathering of children in the hospital and the manner in which they were cared for by the Jewish welfare department and the factors that determined their fate. The account is based primarily on materials from documents related to the Jewish hospital and the Jewish welfare department, which was part of the Reichsvereinigung, and uh, the documents are held today by the Bundesarchiv in Berlin. In addition, I will try to illustrate the situation with a few quotes from post-war memoirs and uh, post-war reports, even if they are very rare. And, uh, Last but not least, I want to give major credit to the groundbreaking research on the subject that has been done by Rivka Elkin already in the 1990s. And I think um, for the past 20 years, nobody really has touched that subject. At the end of December 1942, as a result of a state order, all daycare centers and children homes for Jewish children in Nazi Germany were finally closed. This process of closure and final dissolution began as early as fall of that year. Only three months earlier, in September 1942, 10 child care centers still existed in Berlin, with um, about 1,100 children from infancy uh, to age 12 and older. The dissolution of the institutions was connected with the removal of those fosterlings who were classified as full Jews. 
As the responsible body, the Jewish Welfare Office, which operated within the framework of the Reich Association, the Reichsvereinigung, had to find solutions for the children of the daycare centers who were left without suitable accommodation. In February 1943, Berlin was to become Judenrein, and mass arrests and mass deportations took place. In this action, most Jews were deported from their forced labor assignments without giving any prior notice. Their children were also taken away. Only the children who could not be located in time were left behind. These were then deported in the course of spring 1943 or temporarily assigned to special institutions until their status was cleared. In June 1943, with the closing of the offices of the Reichsvereinigung and the deportation of the Jewish employees, the end came for the Jewish community of Berlin and for German Jewry. The small, very small remains of the headquarters of the Reichsvereinigung then was moved to the Jewish hospital. Here it continued to look after the affairs of the remnants of the German Jewry under the supervision of the Gestapo. The Jewish hospital was thus the very last official Jewish institution in Germany where the remaining official agencies serving the Reichsvereinigung were concentrated. This included the Jewish Welfare Department, which until then had been responsible for all problems of social support for German Jews. From summer, 90, uh, from summer of 1943 onward, all Jewish activities were further restricted and now concentrated mainly on health care and nursing. This was organized by the head of the hospital, Dr. Walter Lustig, who was appointed by the Gestapo as the sole head of the remains of the Reichsvereinigung. <coughs> Within this framework, the Jewish Welfare Office was also active to a limited extent. One of its tasks was to continue the care of the remaining children of Jewish descent who had been grouped together in the Kinderunterkunft, the children's department of the Jewish hospital. In the period uh, between 1943 and 1945, approximately 191 children passed through the hospital, of whom at least 94 remained here until the end of March of 1945. And I know we all remember Berlin had like about 180,000 Jews before the war. These numbers are really, really small. So just give me a few, uh, a, a few words uh, to the family backgrounds. Um, the family situation the children came from was sometimes of great importance for the fate of the children. In order to be saved from the final extinction, it was not uh, enough to come from a mixed marriage. The fact whether the non-Jewish side of the family was the father had high importance. For according to the definition of death sent, as drawn up by the Ministry of Justice on July 15, 1942, a distinction was to be made between children of a Jewish father or Mischling of the first degree and children of a German father. Also of importance was uh, whether the iron parent was still alive. According to the cases, case file existing, um, 53 children had non-Jewish fathers, of whom uh, 38 were stepfathers, while 35 children had non-Jewish mothers. The different situation in which families found themselves hampered welfare attempts to return some of the children to their families, even after their statues had been finally resolved by the courts. Children on the on the instruction of the authorities were closer to the Jewish side according to their racial definition and had been separated from their families, were prevented from remaining at home by the separation enforced by the racial laws. The fate of Cordelia Hoffmann, later on her name was Edwardson, who was separated from her family as a so-called three-quarter Jew, can be used to illustrate the authorities' procedures. Cordelia's mother 
was a mischling of the first degree, her biological father, a Jew. The fact that her mother was married in second marriage to a non-Jewish man and had children in common with him protected only her, not her daughter Cordelia. Despite her Catholic upbringing and despite her adoption by her stepfather and by a family with Spanish nationality. Cordelia and the children similar to Hercules were forbidden to live with her iron family. Some of the children in this category lived with relatives who had mixed marriage statues or with adoptive families until the spring of 1943. In December 1942, it was still possible to find such accommodation arrangements for such children with relatives. They uh, too were collected at the Jewish hospital from the spring of 1943 onwards on the instruction of the Gestapo. The individual, individual case of Cordelia illustrates how guideline, guidelines requiring children to leave the homes of their relatives or foster parents were put into practice. <coughs> the feelings that accompanied the separation from her family and the process of being sent to the children's um, shelter or children's uh, department are described by Cordelia in her memoirs. When one day she was taken from a temporary residence to the Jewish hospital by two half-Jewish youths who served as informers of the Gestapo, um, now she quotes, uh, and she writes about herself in third person. Um, I quote, um, then when they came to pick her up one morning, she would have been ready, if not agreeable. Nevertheless, the girl cried, was afraid, did not want to. The young half-Jews who bought time, time and hoped to buy their own lives by doing the rough work for the Gestapo, handled the girl gently. Usually, they dragged people out of their beds, kicked them, beat them, and yelled." End of quote. Three short cases in which children were brought to the children's department as a result of their own or their parents' hospitalization are intended to illustrate how children who had been classified as full Jews were brought there. The case of seven months old God Joseph, who was brought to the hospital from the Sammellager, the uh, collection camp in Große Hamburger Straße, together with his parents who were ill from scarlet fever. Since the Gestapo was not in the habit of sending Jews with contagious diseases to the East, and uh, we all remember our first session from yesterday when we spoke about um, um, typhus quite a lot. So this is a, a, a similar evidence. Um, nobody would be deported when someone was infected with scarlet fever or typhus. The second case is that of an infant who had been born in the hospital to his scarlet fever stricken mother and whose deportation was therefore delayed. And the third case I came across is the case of a girl who at the age of just one had a terrible accident um, with hot water and very badly burned herself um, all over her body. And uh, she was cured at the hospital for many months only to follow her parents um, to Theresienstadt. While the goal of the Gestapo was uh, to gather children in one place until conditions were ripe for their removal, i.e. deportation. Uh, the people in charge at the Jewish hospital focused on attempts to find ways to release the children from their care, normally to the iron parent, in order to prevent their removal. The activities took place on the legal and, uh, on the legal and social level. One of the goals of the social welfare department was to place the largest possible number of children in the care of uh, the island parent who could provide protection uh, from deportation. Therefore, on one hand, it endeavored to collect data about the parents about whom uh, little or no knowledge existed, 
and on the other hand, to arouse interest in the parents for their children. And uh, by the way, the hospital even paid uh, for uh, a private investigator um, to like locate um, um, uh, an iron parent part. One of the fields of activity was the problem of illegitimate uh, and apparently illegitimate children whose biological father, father and his uh, racial um, affiliation was unknown or had been deliberately not disclosed. In these cases, which were usually dealt with in court, attempts were made to obtain an iron father which would change the child's status. Hilde Kahan, the secretary of Dr. Lustig, um, we remember, the head of the clinic, and uh, by the way, a very highly uh, controversial figure, um, mentioned, uh, so Hilde Kahn mentioned in her post-war report on the Jewish <coughs> hospital that Dr. Lustig uh, tried to find iron fathers among soldiers of Wehrmacht for some children. Presumably, the idea was to find people who would acknowledge um, paternity, but uh, because of their deployment, soldiers on the front would not have uh, to actively care for the child at the time. Among other things, the welfare department also attached great importance to maintaining contact with the father who was in the Wehrmacht. So we have children in the hospital where we know that the father was in the Wehrmacht. Since as long as he was still alive, he presented a kind of life insurance for his children and the children in the, in the children. And if we look at the other side, um, and here I mean the outside of the hospital world, we must also note that the decision to take in a child was not always easy for the family members either. Housing shortages, um, the fear of not being able to provide the child with food, but also the fear of negative reactions among uh, their own social environment prevented family members from taking in children. In many cases, taking in a child wearing the yellow star and self-revealing his or her ancestry, especially invented housing, provoked a negative reaction and rejection on the part of the homeowners and neighbors. The father Schlesinger justified the refusal to take in his son Samuel with the fact that he lived in a subtenant with errands and that only a small room was available to him. Since the door of the apartment would be marked with a Jewish star, however, his landlords would not tolerate this. Despite all the above circumstances, the efforts to return the children to their families were occasionally successful. Depending on how the relatives, father or mother, reacted to the request of the welfare department to take the children in. Among the known cases, 24 children returned home in the period between 1943 and 1945, most of them actually in 1944. From 1944 on, the pressure on the hospital by the Gestapo to fill up the deportation list with children from the hospital also intensified. The reports of the welfare department about so-called arrivals and departures reflect the situation in which most of the transports took place in 1944. Uh, the before mentioned child, Cordelia Hoffman, for example, was sent from the children's department of the hospital to the Sammellager um, on March 9th in 1994, and a day later was assigned uh, for transport to Theresienstadt, along with six other children, including two infants and one child under her supervision. In her memoir, she describes the process of being taken from the children's department and brought crying bitterly to the closed psychiatric ward on the second floor of the building. Through the barred window, she managed to notify her parents of her removal 
before she was taken on transport to Theresienstadt uh, the next morning. Luckily, as you know, as I quote from her memory here, um, she survived. The average length of uh, the stay in the hospital was about one year, but there were also children who stayed here only a very short time before their deportation, and others survived for a longer period of time in the hospital until their liberation. The fact that there were some opportunities for, uh, let's say, um, arrangements in favor of children, even though the hospital operated directly under the eyes of the Gestapo, is shown by the example of the child Sylvia. Her story is mentioned in a report by Charlotte Holzer, who had been working at the Jewish hospital as a nurse for 15 years before getting um, arrested herself. Sylvia, the child, was an offspring of a female Polish dancer and uh, as a Jewish <coughs> artist and a German artist who um, met uh, in Paris and illegally got married. Both were caught after the Nazis had invaded Paris. He was arrested and sentenced to prison because of so-called Rassenschande, while she was deported to Auschwitz. On the way, the mother, on the way to Auschwitz, um, uh, the mother was separated from a one and a half year old child. The child then was transferred to Berlin. And this is how um, Charlotte Holzer describes the, ch describes the child. I quote, Sylvia had become a sweet little girl, but was of course behind in her development like all children in the hospital. When she could not speak yet, she went around the hospital with a spoon and everyone gave her something. They were all starving and everyone gave her something. The child was under special care by my uncle, who was the manager of the hospital, and he managed to get the papers of the child delayed. Thus, the child remained alive." End of quote. What makes the actually very short report on Sylvia also so special is the fact that we can learn something about everyday life of children in the hospital. So the um, going around of the child that cheers up uh, patients, inmates, and workers gives us a small, you know, tiny impression of what everyday life looked at the hospital. And um, here, I also want to follow up on what we talked about in our first session today, uh, when we talked about the connection uh, between body and soul. So as uh, we clearly see also, I have another evidence of that, that as long as the children were there in, in the hospital, um, uh, it was, um, there was individual exchange uh, between uh, the children and other inmates and uh, patients of the hospital, and uh, uh, this kept the spirits up for everyone, so the um, other patients also had enjoyed the company of the children. But everyday life uh, took place in the, shadow, in the shadow of the departures and transports, and accompanied by uh, concern for the health of the children for the daily need of clothing and food. The surviving documents attest to the effort to maintain a standard of nutrition and minimal hygiene. During the day, all older children, age 14 up, had to work nine hours on the forced labor law and were sent to the hospital's kitchen, uh, the laundry and the garden departments, for example. Some of the girls um, assisted the nurses and the children's department. So they were actually inmates at night and workers um, at the children's department caring for other children during the day. Children of school age would stroll around as attending schools were not allowed and private instructions were also forbidden. <coughs> and in the context, um, some children endangered actually themselves 
uh, when they left the hospital grounds during play and then played on the streets um, outside of the hospital without wearing uh, the yellow star and yeah, putting themselves in danger of getting caught. So uh, let me come to the conclusion and let me sum up. Um, despite all the efforts on the part of the hospital to make life bearable for the children, it was a closed facility known as Kinderkatsetchen, children's concentration camp. Even so, it was never officially so um, designated. The picture that emerges of the concentration of children or the gathering of children of Jewish descent in the children's department at the Jewish hospital can serve as evidence of their survival was mainly dependent on developments in the racial politics. Other factors were the actions of the Jewish welfare department and the non-Jewish parent. The final decision-making power, however, was in the hands of the supervising authority, the Gestapo. And in the end, uh, the time factor regard to the end of war also determined what chances of survival children had at the hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you.